What's up fellow movie fans? Welcome to Real to Real, your home for an ever-evolving discussion of film in all of its forms. I am KP. And I'm the mayor. And today we're going to be discussing the 2021 Oscars. KP and I woke up at 5.19 a.m. to get the nominations in. And uh, this is a very exciting thing for us, but also very nerve-wracking. For one, I absolutely hate getting up early in the morning. It's the one day a year I do it. This is a tradition me and him have been doing for years and years, and it's always a very nerve-wracking and exciting thing at the same time because we get very invested in the Oscars, we're huge fans, but you know, we know the Oscars sometimes can be a, a little wonky, but thankfully for this year, I think it's been a solid year with everything that has happened in 2020. Yeah, I'd say considering what limited options we had from last year, and um, you know, what our worries were, you know, there was always the talk, you know, like, all right, Oscars. Bad Boys for Life and Sonic the Hedgehog. Ooh. Best picture. Here we go. The invisible Man getting at least eight noms. At least eight. <laughs> so it's nice to see that, obviously, yeah, as much as all films are entertaining, that we found um, a core of, you know, that, that exemplifies the quality of film that we come to embrace around Oscar time for the most part. The last year has been um, kind of rough, and obviously um, two years prior, Oscars had a, a, a real real special year, you know? And they made up for it last year, yeah. you know, on top of just, you know, Parasite taking top honors, but it was just a good year. And so coming into this year, we were just really scared we were gonna see a weird amalgam, some monster yeah. <laughs> of, of a list. Like, yeah. what is this bastardization <laughs> of what we love in film? I was expecting like four Best Picture nominees. Like it was going to be like the smallest thing and we were just going to kind of just like, just ignore this year. Yep. But it's been a real pleasant surprise. There's been a lot of films I end up loving. Nothing I'm like truly over the moon like, oh my God about, but there's still so many good movies. And thankfully, the Academy made, for the most part, perfect choices. Yeah, we talked about it that morning, you know, when we got up. Um, how at the end of it, um, we were surprised that of all the things, the Oscars had like the best nominee list. We were just like, okay, yeah, that's always kind of been on the radar, yes. on the bubble, as the mayor likes to say constantly. <laughs> These are always in discussion, so nothing was blindsiding us. Yes, it's between the Globes and everything. I'm one of the people that, that looks a bit too much into precursors. That's been the balance of KP and then I. KP trusts his senses. He's a well-seasoned vet in movies, and I'm kind of very cynical about the Oscars, so I'm always watching like every facet, like chess pieces on a board. But even then, obviously, uh, you can't predict everything. Even when you think everything might be a deadlock in some of these categories, I feel we're dead on, there's still some ridiculous surprises for good, for the most part, and some that are very odd. You know, the Academy, for how much you think they're going to be by the numbers, they'll still, like, one more curveball for you, and they'll still throw something in. We're happy, like, yeah. with the eight nominees. Yeah. Yeah, nothing truly surprising within the eight nominees. Uh, as KP mentioned earlier, there was a lot of things on the bubble. Uh, Sound of Metal was one that I was hoping would make it in, and it did. And But there's a lot of other ones that you know almost seem like locks, and especially when you look at the nominations. it's uh, We got the solid eight, and there's, like I said, nothing surprising. But knowing that they can hit ten, it's still kind of weird that the fact that Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which got five nominations, and One Night in Miami, she got three nominations, two films that have been talked about all year long, didn't squeeze in was a little bit of a surprise. But the eight we got have been wonderful with the only like somewhat surprise for me personally is that the father resurged really hard at the towards this end of the race here. <laughs> you know, it's been floating around for the globes and other awards, but to come in with six nominations is pretty stellar. The father is the the kind of mystery phantom floating out there in theaters and you know in between people's conversations that I don't even know anyone that could have seen it yeah. or did see it. Yeah, it's it's like all critics. critics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we're excited about it just because yeah the early talks were so stupendous. Obviously yeah. Anthony Hopkins, who's one of our favorites of like the veteran actors, just has always been the talk. And Olivia Coleman has been right on his heels, you know, as this pair, as the father daughter. So we've just been excited about that. But to yeah, to see the other nominations it got was just so so nice. Yeah. We we're like this makes us excited yeah. to see it. Because like the other films we've seen we've heard it talks and like I said father we don't know anyone personally who has seen it you know um, so it's I, I'm glad it's there and it makes me much more excited to see it I was already looking forward to it because Anthony Hopkins say no more um, but to, to see it sneak in and to get so many nominations is fantastic but I'm, I'm also very happy because there's one film I was looking forward to all year long which was Minari a film I've been just supporting big time I, I saw it out of Boston Film Society's uh, uh, film festival and it was wonderful and this whole year, I'd be like, come on, just at least get one or two nominations. <laughs> I was just hoping, you know. A24 films haven't been doing the, the most uh, 
well in the past few years. So for Minari to pull through and get a handful of nominations has been very heartwarming to me, very dear to my heart. For that yeah. film. He had already gotten me hyped up for Minari, and so I watched it myself, and I just felt like I was like, that was a lock. I mean, you know, but of course, you know, like like the mayor said, it's just like he just it's always better to err on the side of caution, you know, for for him. Uh, but for me, I was just like, it's just a done deal, right? I mean, it's just it's not only does it feel very. I would say easy to digest for the Oscars. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very human story. It's family. It's a period film as well, but it's got heart. It's got a lot of uh, uh, depth and a lot of uh, space to let a lot of things breathe. And it just felt so good. And obviously, I think I was just coming off the high of last year's Parasite when I'm yeah. like, come on, Korea's here. Yeah. There's no stopping them. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the Korea and the American combination because it's such an American story just told from a Korean perspective, too. So it's, it's a beautiful combination. Two things coming together. The Academy's finally starting to open up a lot more to this stuff. So that's been the, the most touching of the nominations for me. We got Mink, we've got uh, Nomad Land, which were, you know, kind of obviously always on the list. Yeah. You know, Promising Young Woman was another kind of indie one, as well as Sound of Metal. Yeah. Um, being these little indie films, we weren't sure we were going to make it, but we had our hopes for it. And then, of course, like we said, Trial of Chicago 7. It's a solid piece of just standard courtroom Oscar bait in a yeah, way yeah. but at the same time I do appreciate it for what it is I'm not one of those yeah. people that just kind of finds it you know why is it taking up space it's good it's neat nice. I've always loved Sorkin you know I've I've you know appreciated him since you know the American president and a few good men and obviously into the West Wing so just to see where not only is he bringing his chops continually to the big screen but obviously now he's behind the camera it's, it's a nice like you said a very nice well-rounded bit of nominees and I agree considering that it's always has room for 10 and thankfully this limitation to the category is no longer going to be a thing come yes, next year it will always year. have 10 nominees so we don't have to do a second guess on what's going to fit it's just like what are going to be the 10 versus like how many are going to get in there yeah you know so it's just yeah it's a shame for two um solid uh contributions this last year like ma rings black bottom and one night in miami which we also saw and we really did enjoy yeah. that they couldn't make the cut this year and that's just a shame i'm not we're not the kind of people that look too critically in the uh the kind of uh omissions of ulterior motives especially yeah. when you look at what's nominated this year you've got minari the korean film you've got judas and the black messiah you know a very passionate african-american story you know historically based i don't really see a lot of prejudice in that so when we hear that that kind of it doesn't like upset us but it just kind of disappoints us it's like yeah. do we really have to fall on that you know yeah. kind of like easy going you know finger pointing to like why a, a movie doesn't get nominated for us it's just a shame you know and that's our judgment of the algorithm you know the the way that the academy does the voting process um for nominating things and that's kind of a real big issue and like we said going into next year there's no room for that anymore yeah. it's just about most votes from those last ones it's like all right we just put them in there yeah. and they they got it Always so they 10. deserve yeah yeah so I'm, I'm glad it's finally done with, mm -hmm. because i hate trying to guess just the number of nominees it's always like a, a, a fun game to try guessing and, I, and i'm done with it let's get it to the 10. Yep. So I'm sorry they missed out. I, I do enjoy both films and I'm glad they got some love. Um, director had some fun surprises. There were some things we were worried about going into director because in the start of the race there's a lot of like ones on the fringe and like a lot of front runners at the time I'm like I don't really care for this. But now looking the five we got are fantastic. I'm happy. Absolutely stellar. I'm yeah. happy. Yeah, so the, the one that, you know, you've all been hearing about has been Chloe Zhao for Nomadland. She's been the front runner. And on top of that, we also have Emerald Fennell being nominated for Promising Young Woman. So it's the first time in Oscar history two women have been nominated for Best Director, and rightfully so. Both women delivered immensely powerful films this year. And so I'm just happy that they both got in there. But on top of that, we also have three other stellar men that have got in there, too. Mm -hmm. David Fincher, one of the greatest directors living getting his third nomination after Curious Case and Social Network, picking one up for Mank, which is great because that's a personal story with him and his father. And then you got Lee Isaac Chung for Minari yet again. Super happy that he got in. Uh, you're going to be hearing me sing praise about Minari the whole way. I'm not biased, guys. I try not to be that is. <laughs> and then we also got um, the biggest surprise, the one that actually made me like squeal. As both of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I literally screamed because it kind of came out of left field. That's Thomas Vinkerberg for Another Round, uh, which is a foreign language film. Uh, Vinkerberg is one of uh, Europe's best directors from Denmark, and he delivered one of my favorite films of the past decade with The Hunt, and I was singing praise about that movie all decade, but I got no love for the Academy, and finally the, another round comes out, and enough people, especially in the directing branch, got him through, and rightfully so. I think he's a fantastic director. Another round has 
been on the top of my list for 2020. Yeah, that, that's, as well as for me, another round has been yeah our, my number one, and we've been singing its praises since we watched it together. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, to see it not only make it, but also obviously the discussion of uh, director nominees this year. You know, Sorkin not making the cut is a good thing. You know, we talked about this. We again, yeah. we sing the praises of Sorkin in this house, um, but that doesn't change the fact of certain people's strengths versus where they're growing. And that's the thing that Sorkin is growing in. It's not to say that he's a bad director, but there are better directorial efforts this last yes. year. The beautiful thing is that Sorkin is getting better with every film. Yeah. And this is only his second film. To, to have him behind the camera in that as well gets to show a little bit of him kind of flexing a new muscle. Yeah. And so it's great. That's commendable. And again, he's been getting the nominations. Aaron Sorkin not being there, we're actually grateful for. Yeah. Hey, you'll get it eventually, Sorkin, in a way that we feel you will earn it. And like you said, I mean, come on. Think of, I, mean, yeah, yeah. Ah! I like the Academy just opening up more to foreign language directors. You know, we get caught up in all the big names of Hollywood. It's fun that, you know, obviously to, to stretch out, you know, we're supposed to encompass all the film all across the globe. So it's good that the throw a nomination, you know, even when we can't nominate every big foreign language film, it's good to give some recognition to directors that are putting out such great bodies of work like Think of Yeah, because the Academy should be representing the world. You know, as much as exactly. people love to have that argument, that was the argument two years ago with Parasite, people yeah. arguing, well, it's nominated for foreign language, why well, should it be nominated for, for Best Picture? It's like they're two different categories, and for good reason. Picture does need to represent the entire world, while you know foreign language and now international, as it's called, kind of really personifies the outside of our state lines kind of thing. It's good that Best Picture is is uh, celebrating all of uh, the world's cinema, and so yeah, with Parasite, and then obviously with Cold War, and now with another round making those top honors, this is a good step forward. I hope that we'll start seeing foreign language films breaking the mold into Best Picture yeah. more often. I know a lot of people will love either Shaka King for Judas and the Black Messiah or Regina King for One Night in Miami, and they both give fantastic directorial debuts, I yes. think, for the most part, or at least for Shaka King's his first major work. Mm -hmm. And um, yet again, I wish we can put more nominees in here because they both did fantastic jobs. But the five we have are just all so great. You know, there's no weak one where I can interchange. I, I'm just really satisfied with the director. I get to talk about Minari Go more? for it. Go. Yeah, Go. Sorry to do, cut you do off. The excitement's here. <laughs> um, the, these five, thankfully, have been kind of locked since the SAGs, but uh, Stephen Yun was an actor. I was a champion back in 2018 for Burning, which was a, a Korean film, and uh, the film didn't get nominated for foreign language film, and while uh, Stephen did so well with all the critic circles, he did not make it into the major categories. And he's been such a great actor to watch ever since he came to film, mostly from Walking Dead. And his performance in Minari has just so much heart in it. It's such a, a strong performance, and Steven does a great job of uh, putting that out there because it's not a very big, flashy performance. It has some funny moments and some very strong emotional moments. So for him to actually get that fifth slot, which was super competitive this year, it just made sense with Minari's rise that he was able to make it in. It's been the lock for the, those big four, and Steven Yeun has been, again, one of the underdogs that we've been rooting for to get the nomination after watching Minari. For me, it just didn't feel like a question, but obviously the realism that you know the mayor constantly puts with me, that one I understood though, because of the competitive nature of actor every year. And obviously, again, the profound um, precedent, he's you know he's broken the barrier. Yes. The first Korean uh, actor to, to get nominated for a lead performance. And again, it's justified. This isn't just a milestone of a breakthrough you know, in progress. It's just, it's about time. It's just really, it's like, yeah, yeah, thank you. You know, we've got enough Asian cinema for the past 75, 80 years. In the acting categories, it just never happened. Crouch, Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Parasite, these huge beloved films that got tons of nominations and not one acting them. So for uh, Steven to come in here and be the first Korean American lead to get it, ever in 93 years of the Oscars is, is huge. It's important. And, yeah, and that also then goes over to Riz Ahmed, you know, who is another Asian American actor, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to see uh, both of them get nominated. Also, Riz, first Muslim actor to get nominated. Yeah, 93 years. We're, it took him long enough, but we, we're making progress, you know, and yet again, two performances that are highly deserving. Uh, we love Sound and Metal. And his performance is so great. I've been a fan of Riz for a long time, so I'm happy to see him get it. Anthony Hopkins, I just know, is great in The Father. We haven't seen it yet. Gary Oldman does a great job in Mank. He's Gary, Old He's Gary Oldman. Yep. He always delivers. And, of course, the performance that everyone's been talking about is Chadwick Boseman in his final, most stunning performance of his career. This is another category where it felt pretty much locked, but had the ridiculous fifth slot problem for the longest time. Yeah, and the, the Globes very much uh, kind of paved the way for that fifth slot to kind of kind of get cemented. We, we have our thoughts about 
how that came about. Yeah. Not to say there's any question on Andre Day's performance. Uh, the mayor got to watch the film yes. and he can verify Andre Day's work is credible, yes. absolutely. Um, the film, however, is a bit of a struggle bit of a slog. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on with that. Um, I have my opinions about the legacy of actress nominations, especially in lead for the Oscars. They tend to nominate um, very, very uh, boisterous performances, specifically for women, um, but also they tend to gravitate towards uh, like nudity for women. That's like, that's a problem with the Oscars. You know, I think of uh, Kate Winslet's win for The Reader. Mm -hmm. You know, it was about 13 years ago. You know, she wins for The Reader, but Revolutionary Road. Oh my goodness. That performance. Yeah. I, and everything else, again, lines up really well. Like Absolutely. you said, there was a little bit uneven here or there, but thankfully everything kind of rounded back around to like that top original listing of like, these are the short list, and it, yeah. it's still a short list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Francis Viola and Carrie and Vanessa, you're just like, yep. You're all good. Yep. But that fifth one, it's a straight bloody fist fight over there, but you four are locked. All four women give fantastic performances in their own right. Um, Viola Davis gets to absolutely shine in Ma Rainey. She's yeah, again, consistent as one of the best working actresses in Hollywood. Vanessa Kirby in her like huge breakout role. And while Peace of the Woman was not, in my opinion, the most satisfying film, Vanessa got to go all out, and I'm just happy to see her get this nomination and hopefully push forward with her career. Uh, but the big two, in my opinion, is definitely Carrie Mulligan for Promising Young Woman, who I'm, I'm rooting for big time. Same. Uh, Carrie's been one of the most consistent actresses in Hollywood, and this performance is is brave, it's funny, it's it's sharp, it has a lot of bite to it, it's a fantastic performance, and she helps carry such a, a strong and very hard story to come across. And it's a modern story, yes. which is, I, I, you don't see that come across very well. Mm -hmm. That's why we've been rooting for Promising a Woman, and Absolutely. for its five nominations, especially for picture, I hate to use something so <laughs> so <laughs> contemporary. It's a very woke nomination, yeah. but it, that's a good thing in this case. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a very important topic, yeah. and it's told <laughs> so bravely and so stylistically Absolutely. that it, 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 it pops, it mm -hmm. shines. Very, it's You can't turn away from it. And then that, to round out the five, you know, we have Frances McDormand, you oh know, steady uh, Frances, who always shows up, always delivers. She's already a two-time winner you know, for Fargo and three billboards. If there's a chance she can win her third, and then there's a chance she can win her fourth next year, but we'll see about that. Nomadland, um, uh, fantastic movie, and it's carried yet again all on Francis's shoulders. She carries such a natural feel, and for a character that you never really know how to connect at first, Francis, you feel driven with her with every every you know road she takes in this film. I think she's absolutely fantastic. If she walks away with a third, I would not be upset. Yeah, wouldn't surprise me either. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Wow, this category is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of category fraud with mm -hmm. what's going on right now. Lakeith Stanfield is arguably the main focal character and obviously Daniel Kaluuya's performance uh, as Fred Hampton. So Lakeith has always been pushed for the lead performance mm -hmm. all year long. And Daniel Kaluuya was always, you know, the supporting um, and justifiably and, you know, the, you know, I think in our eyes, the front runner um, for supporting actor and those wins he's been hitting up are validating. So Lakeith making support supporting actor along with his co-star when it was always arguable that if anything both of them were co-leads more than anything it would be a better chance for Daniel Kaluuya to get nominated in lead actor with Lakeith than the supporting it feels slightly disingenuous this has nothing to do with Lakeith his performance is yeah. fantastic and him being nominated is a good thing he's great in it but just the powers that be the politics of Oscars uh kind of uh Sneaking that in there is a yeah. little little suspect. The campaign from uh, Warner Brothers and everyone sponsoring Juice the Black Messiah is that Lakeith was going to be the lead. So for them to uh, have so many people love his performance to the point where they're basically writing it in, you know, it's like voting for the president and actually it coming through on the ballot. That was without a doubt the biggest surprise. You know, I, I heard it and my mind almost melted out of my ears. So I was like, excuse me? Like, I would have bet the house that Lakeith wasn't going to get nominated in supporting, you know. Um, but I'm so thankful. Lakeith has been one of the most consistent actors of the past few years. He's been like on, on the hot radar along with a lot of, other, of the other fellow nominees here. Yeah, a lot of young actors this year. Yeah, you know, Riz, Steven Yeun, and Daniel Kaluuya have all had this, like, this great hype, and they're all nominated basically in the same year, which is crazy. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm happy to see both of them get nominated. Um, but the big thing was Paul Ratchie. Um, for The Sound of Metal. Um, it's been a scary year for him very. in terms of our support of him. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've always wanted to have him in that slot because it was a no-brainer for me. His performance in Sound of Metal is so touching and he has one of the most impactful scenes I've seen in a movie in the past year or two. Absolutely incredible, but because he's not a well-known actor, 
I didn't think you'd have enough push. It's always like the thing, you know, why go for the smaller actor when you can get the bigger name? Well, and it was yeah. justifiable, though, too, as yeah. we've been leading up to, you know, this last Monday, mm-hmm. it's, we've been seeing his name not showing up yes. in the category. Mm-hmm. So that fear was valid, and it was starting to be very frustrating and disappointing to see such an omission. Yeah, because so. the, the five that we got for supporting actor, yet again, it's just a fantastic batch. You know, Leslie Odom Jr., is, as Sam Cooke delivers a firehouse performance, a powerhouse performance. Um, he, the pipes, let alone the acting caliber. I'm just so happy to see Leslie Odom Jr. deliver this because his performance in Hamilton's already so beloved and he kills it in that. So I'm happy he got the love here. I gotta talk about how supporting actresses here has been, without a doubt, one of the most chaotic I have ever seen in the history of me watching the Oscars. Usually we talk about how we have three, sometimes even just two front runners, and we know that there's locks. Supporting actress has been just a game of musical chairs from all the precursors, and all five nominees at some point I felt like could have been bumped off, which is the craziest thing. I, I Come Oscar Sunday, I, I don't even know who's gonna win. I'm, I'm still flabbergasted with the five nominees, but at the same time, at least it kind of makes sense. But when you had like Amanda Seyfried, who was the talk early on, everyone said she was a lock, and then she started not showing up in certain precursors. Olivia Coleman, uh, the father started losing steam, but she still pulls through. Glenn Close is in one of the most ugly, bad movies of the year, and this feels like just such a pity nomination. She's even nominated for a Razzie this year, and she still gets in for the Academy Award. It's just so bizarre to me. And Maria Bakalova is in Borat 2, and I, while I know Borat 1 got a nomination at the Oscars, I didn't think it would happen again, let alone an acting nom, you know, and it, her performance is uh, pretty nuts, so it's well-deserved. It's brave. It, it's brave. It's brave. <laughs> if there's one word, we can call it. Yeah. And then... Uh, you and for uh, Minari, it's my, my, you know, I just, I'm always worried about the Academy voting for Asian actors and actresses. So I had very little hope that the Academy would actually pull through, but here we are. She actually made it in, and rightfully so. So all five of these pieces have been moved around the board, and other, you know, people have been filled in. We had Jodie Foster at one point, Alan Bernstein for Peace of the Woman had talk. But in the end, a lot of these fives that were kind of the talk early on have all made their way back around. There's no fun one. There's not even a close one. It can it's, it's pick them. All of the uh, screenplay nominations were always on the on the short list, yeah. um, and so you know some things were going to make the cut and some things weren't. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that obviously the original category is the stronger one. There's just a lot of oh, yeah. merit to a lot of the original nominations compared to the adapted, and that's really cool to see. One Night Miami, Nomadland, which felt like locks, and then you know the father was you know on the, on the cusp because yet again we weren't too sure if it was even going to make it, but it, it squeezed in. But then Borat. Two. two for two, baby. Two for two, man. Sasha Baron Cohen just out of the park with these. He, he's gotten now two nominations for screenplay. White Tiger got nominated, and this has had some talk throughout the year because I hear it's a great faithful adaptation to the book. Original, which is just a perfect five for five. You know, the caliber is so strong. Documentaries have been, usually every year it's like one or two that are stand out. These past few years, it's been like four or five, and then some are just not even getting into the nomination. Because it's so overly crowded with yeah. quality. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and some of the front runners from the past few years didn't even get nominated, so that was my fear going to this one, because KP and I actually watched a good handful of documentaries here. We're trying to be ahead of the curve. Watched Boy State, which I absolutely was enthralled with. We watched uh, Totally Under Control, and... I, I watched uh, Dick Johnson is Dead on my own, which a lot of people have had talks for. None of those three made the cut. It's a little heartbreaking, but when you look at the five, when you read what the five documentaries are, Collective is another big uh, nominee. It's also nominated for Best Foreign Language Film. And you had Time, which has been the talk all year, one of the biggest you know, uh, documentaries that is even being picked up for Criterion. That's how beloved it is. Netflix had a, a cute documentary about a man's bond with an octopus. Yeah. yeah. What a weird year for cinematography. It, it's. Yeah. I gotta say, like you know, for all the categories we know, 
it's really weak this year. You know, and not to say that it, it, it uh, diffuses, you know, some of the ones that were always locks, like Nomadland, in our eyes, kind of yeah. feeling like the front runner. Judas and the Black Messiah and Trial of Chicago 7 getting nominated for cinematography. You know, that, that feels weird to us. And especially when we think of other movies that we enjoy, but don't necessarily love, like Tenet. Visually captivating mm -hmm. film. So it's like, I already knew cinematography wasn't going to be like the strong category. But it just sucks to see the category just be so kind of mellow for the most part, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. oh, No Man Land looks good, a lot of big, beautiful shots. News of the world, same deal, got kind of big, beautiful shots. Score always had a front-loaded kind of like two to three locks, and yeah. obviously the double nomination for Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross <laughs> for obviously the front runner in our eyes with Soul, that yeah. original concept to the boisterously beautiful, organically real brass orchestral of uh, Menk. I'm at least super stoked to see Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, who I think are like the gods of music score since 2010 and up. They yeah. every time they have a score, it's like for me like I don't care what the movie is. It could be the Emoji movie too. If they're doing the score, I'm there day one. Soul has also been the big talk all year for animated, and it's, if you don't bet on Soul, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I know Wolf Walkers has a lot of love, Onward being another Pixar film has something, and for us, the the, the fun surprise of seeing uh, Sean the Sheep uh, getting a, a, a second nomination, because the first one got nominated, yeah. and the second one. <laughs> uh, Yet again, the category wasn't that stacked this year. I just love the shout outs to Claymation and or Stop Motion. Yeah. Yeah, and so that Sean the Sheep is two for two nomination just warms my heart. Wolf Walkers for being an independent film, getting a lot of love too, has been great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really all we got. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of uh, nominations, and obviously there's a lot of other categories that we didn't get into. Um, you know, Some that were just not enough time right now. Others were just not as informed. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining us for this little Oscar discussion. You know, We can't wait to uh, share our thoughts come Oscar night. We'll try our best to kind of do a, a fresh video that night, just a little quick little recap. We won't mm -hmm. make it too long. And um, we look forward to hearing your comments and your opinions, if you disagree or like. Please go ahead and subscribe. and. Uh, you know, uh, like our video, you know, ding the notification to hopefully get our next uh, posting for a new video. And we'll see you next time. Bye, Take guys. Care, guys. Bye.